Hi, it's Matt Dolby. I'm back with the uh, reading of Queen Mab by uh, Percy Shelley. And this week it'll be uh, Canto 4 and the notes associated with that. So, Queen Mab, Canto 4. How beautiful this night! The balmiest sigh which vernal zephyrs breathe in evening's ear were discord to the speaking quietude that wraps this moveless scene. Heaven's ebon vault, studded with stars unutterably bright through which the moon's unclouded grandeur rolls, seems like a canopy which love had spread to curtain her sleeping world. Yon gentle hills robed in a garment of untrodden snow, yon darksome rocks whence icicles depend, so stainless that their white and glittering spires tinge not the moon's pure gleam. Yon castled steep, whose banner hangeth o'er the time-worn tower so idly that rapt fancy deemeth it a metaphor of peace. All form a scene where musing solitude might love to lift her soul above this sphere of earthiness. Where silence undisturbed might watch alone, so cold, so bright, so still. The orb of day, in southern climes, o'er ocean's waveless field, sinks sweetly smiling. Not the faintest breath steals o'er the unruffled deep. The clouds of eve reflect unmoved on the lingering beam of day, and Vesper's image on the western main is beautifully still. Tomorrow comes, cloud upon cloud, in dark and deepening mass, rolled o'er the blackened waters, the deep roar of distant thunder mutters awfully, tempest enfolds its pinion o'er the gloom that shrouds the boiling surge. The pitiless fiend, with all his winds and lightnings, tracks his prey. The torn deep yawns, the vessel finds a grave beneath its jagged gulf. Ah, whence yon glare that fires the arch of heaven, that dark red smoke blotting the silver moon. The stars are quenched in darkness, and the pure and spangling snow gleams faintly through the gloom that gathers round. Hark to that roar whose swift and deafening peals in countless echoes through the mountains ring, startling pale midnight on her starry throne. Now swells the intermingling din, the jar frequent and f Frightful of the bursting bomb, the falling beam, the shriek, the groan, the shout, the ceaseless clangour and the rash of men, inebriate with rage. Loud and more loud the discord grows till pale death shuts the scene, and o'er the conqueror and conquered draws his cold and bloody shroud. Of all the men whom day's departing beam saw blooming there in proud and vigorous health, of all the hearts that beat with anxious life at sunset there, how few survive, how few are beating now. All is deep silence, like the fearful calm that slumbers in the storm's portentous pause, save when the frantic wail of widowed love comes shuddering on the blast, or the faint moan with which some soul bursts from the frame of clay wrapped round its struggling powers. The grey morn draws on the mournful scene. The sulphurous smoke before the icy wind rolls slow away and the bright beams of frosty morning dance along the spangling snow. There, tracks of blood, even to the forest's depth and scattered arms and lifeless warriors whose hard lineaments death's self could change not mark the dreadful path of the outsallying victors. Far behind, black ashes note where their proud city stood. Within yon forest is a gloomy glen. Each tree which guards its darkness from the day waves are a warrior's tomb. I see thee shrink, surpassing spirit. Wert thou human else? I see a shade of doubt and horror fleet across thy stainless features, yet fear not. This is no unconnected misery, nor stands uncaused and irretrievable. Man's evil nature, that apology which kings who rule and cowards who crouch set up for their unnumbered crimes, sheds not the blood which desolates the discord-wasted land from kings and priests and statesmen war arose, whose safety is man's deep unbettered woe, whose grandeur his debasement. 
Let the axe strike at the root, the poison tree will fall, and where its venomed exultations spread ruin and death and woe where millions lie, quenching the serpent's famine and their bones bleaching unburied in the putrid blast, a garden shall arise, in loveliness surpassing fabled Eden. Hath nature's soul that formed this world so beautiful that spread earth's lap with plenty and life's smallest cord strung to unchanging unison that gave the happy birds their dwelling in the grove that yielded to the wanderers of the deep the lovely silence of the unfathomed main and filled the meanest worm that crawls in dust with spirit, thought and love on man alone partial in causeless malice wantonly heaped ruin, vice and slavery his soul blasted with withering curses, placed afar the meteor happiness that shuns his grasp. But serving on the frightful gulf to glare, went wide beneath his footsteps? Nature, no. Kings, priests and statesmen blast the human flower, even in its tender bud. Their influence darts like subtle poison through the bloodless veins of desolate society. The child, ere he can lisp his mother's sacred name, swells with the unnatural pride of crime, and lifts his baby sword even in a hero's mood. This infant arm becomes the bloodiest scourge of devastated earth. While specious names learnt in soft childhood's unsuspecting hour serve as the sophisms with which manhood dims bright reason's ray and sanctifies the sword, upraised to shed a brother's innocent blood. Let priest-led slaves cease to proclaim that man inherits vice and misery, when force and falsehood hang even o'er the cradled babe, stifling with rudest grasp all natural good. Ah, to the stranger soul, when first it peeps from its new tenement and looks abroad for happiness and sympathy, how stern and desolate a tract is this wide world. How withered all the buds of natural good. No shade, no shelter from the sweeping storms of pitiless power. On its wretched frame, poisoned perchance by the disease and woe, heaped on the wretched parent whence it sprung by morals, law and custom, the pure winds of heaven that renovate the insect tribes may breathe not. The untainting light of day may visit not its longings. It is bound ere it, is, ere it has life, yea, all the chains are forged long ere it being. All liberty and love and peace is torn from its defencelessness, cursed from its birth, even from its cradle doomed to abjectness and bondage. Throughout this varied and eternal world, soul is the only element, the block that for uncounted ages has remained, the moveless pillar of a mountain's weight is active living spirit. Every grain is sentient, both in unity and part, and the minutest atom comprehends a world of loves and hatreds. These beget evil and good. Hence truth and falsehood spring. Hence will and thought and action, all the germs of pain and pleasure, sympathy or hate, that variegate the eternal universe. Soul is not more polluted than the beams of heaven's pure orb, ere round their rapid lines the taint of earth-born atmosphere arise. Man is of soul and body, formed for deeds of high resolve, on fancy's boldest wing to soar unwearied, fearlessly to turn the keenest pangs to peacefulness, and taste the joys which mingled sense and spirit yield. Or he is formed for abjectness and woe, to grovel on the dunghill of his fears, to shrink at every sound, to quench the flame of natural love in sensualism, to know that hour is blessed when, on his worthless days, the frozen hand of death shall set its seal. Yet fear the cure, though hating the disease. The one is man that hereafter, shall hereafter be, the other man as vice has made him now. War is the statesman's game. The priest's delight, the lawyer's jest, the hired assassin's trade, and... To those royal murderers whose mean thrones are bought by crimes of treachery and gore, the bread they eat, the staff on which they lean. Guards garbed in blood-red livery surround their palaces, participate the crimes that force defends, and from a nation's rage secures the crown, which all the curses reach, that famine, frenzy, woe and penury breathe. 
These are the hired bravos who defend the tyrant's throne, the bullies of his fear. These are the sinks and channels of worst vice, the refuse of society, the dregs of all that is most vile. Their cold hearts blend deceit with sternness, ignorance with pride. All that is mean and villainous with rage, which hopelessness of good and self-contempt alone might kindle. They are decked in wealth, honour and power, then are sent abroad to do their work. The pestilence that stalks in gloomy triumph through some eastern land is less destroying. They cajole with gold and promises of fame, the thoughtless use already crushed with servitude. He knows his wretchedness too late and cherishes repentance for his ruin when his doom is sealed in golden blood. Those too the tyrants serve who, skilled to snare the feet of justice and the toils of law, stand ready to oppress the weaker still and, right or wrong, will vindicate for gold, sneering at public virtue which beneath their pitiless tread lies torn and trampled, where honour sits smiling at the sale of truth. Then grave and hoary-headed hypocrites, without a hope, a passion, or a love, who through a life of luxury and lies have crept by flattery to the seats of power, support the systems whence their honours flow. They have three words, well, tyrants know their use, well, pray for them with their loan, with usury, torn from a bleeding world, God, hell, and heaven. A vengeful, pitiless and almighty fiend, whose mercy is a nickname for the rage of tameless tigers hungering for blood. Hell, a red gulf of everlasting fire where poisonous and undying worms prolong eternal misery to those hapless slaves whose life has been a penance for its crimes. And heaven, a mead for those who dare belie their human nature, quake, believe and cringe before the mockeries of earthly power. These tools are the tyrant's tempers to his work, wheels in his wrath, and as he wills destroys, omnipotent in wickedness. The while youth springs, age moulders, manhood tamely does his bidding, bribed by short-lived joys to lend force to the weakness of his trembling arm. They rise, they fall, one generation comes yielding its harvest to destruction's scythe, It fades, another blooms, yet behold, red glows the tyrant's stab mark on its bloom, withering and cankering deep its passive prime. He has invented lying words and modes, empty and vain as his own coreless heart, evasive meanings, nothing of much sound to lure the heedless victim to the toils spread round the valley of its paradise. Look to thyself priest, conqueror, or prince, whether thy trade is falsehood and thy lusts deep wallow in the earnings of the poor with whom thy master was, or thou delightest in the numbering or the myriads of the slain, or misery weighing nothing in the scale against thy short-lived fame, or thou dost load with cowardice and crime the groaning land, the pomp king. Look to thy wretched self, Aye, art thou not the veriest slave that e'er crawled on the loathing earth? Are not thy days, days of unsatisfying listlessness? Dost thou not cry, ere night's long rack is o'er, when will the morning come? Is not thy youth a vain and feverish dream of sensualism, thy manhood bleating with unripe disease? Are not thy views of unregretted death drear, comfortless and horrible? Thy mind, is it not morbid as thy nerveless frame, incapable of judgment, hope, or love? And dost thou wish the errors to survive that bar thee from all sympathies of good after the miserable interest thou holdest in their protraction? When the grave has swallowed up thy memory and thyself, thou dost desire the bane that poisons earth to twine its roots around thy coffined clay, spring from thy bones and blossom on thy tomb that of its fruit thy babes may eat and die and the footnote for canto four of queen mab is connected to the lines these are the hired bravos who defend the tyrant's throne To employ murder as a means of justice is an idea which a man of enlightened mind will not dwell upon with pleasure 
to march forth in rank and file with all the pomp of streamers and trumpets for the purpose of shooting at our fellow men as a mark to inflict upon them all the variety of wound and anguish, to leave them weltering in their blood, to wander over the field of desolation and count the number of the dying and the dead, are employments which, in thesis, we may maintain to be necessary, but which no good man will contemplate with gratulation and delight. A battle, we suppose, is won. Thus truth is established. Thus the cause of justice is confirmed. It surely requires no common sagacity to discern the connection between this immense heap of calamities and the assertion of truth or the maintenance of justice. Kings and ministers of state, the real authors of the calamity, sit unmolested in their cabinet, while those against whom the fury of the storm is directed are, for the most part, persons who have been trepanned into the service, or who are dragged unwillingly from their peaceful homes into the field of battle. A soldier is a man whose business is to kill those who never offended him, and who are the innocent martyrs of other men's iniquities. Whatever may become the abstract question of the justifiableness of war, it seems impossible that a soldier should not be dep depraved and unnatural being. To these more serious and momentous considerations, it may be proper to add a recollection of the ridiculousness of the military character. Its first constituent is obedience. A soldier is, of all descriptions of men, the most completely a machine. Yet his profession inevitably teaches him something of dogmatism, swaggering and a self-consequence. He is like the puppet of a showman, who at the very time he is made to strut and swell and display the most farcical airs, we perfectly know cannot assume the most insignificant gesture, advance either to the right or left, but as he is moved by his exhibitor. Godman's Inquirer, Essay 4. 5. I will here subjoin a little poem so strongly expressive of my abhorrence of despotism and falsehood that I fear lest it may never again be depicted so vividly. This opportunity is perhaps the only one that will ever occur of rescuing it from oblivion. Falsehood and Vice, a dialogue. Whilst monarchs laughed upon their thrones to hear the famished nation's groans and hugged the wealth wrung from the woe that makes its eyes and veins o'erflow, those thrones high built on the heaps of bones where frenzied famine sleeps, where slavery wields her scourge of iron, red with man's unheeded gore and war's mad fiends the scene environ, mingling with shrieks a drunken roar, their vice and falsehood took their stand, high raised above the unhappy land. Falsehood. Brother, arise from the dainty fare which thousands have toiled and bled to bestow. A finer feast for thine hungry ear is the news I bring of human woe. Vice. And, secret one, what hast thou done to compare in thy tumid pride with me, I, whose career through the blasted years has been tracked by despair and agony? Falsehood. What have I done? I have torn the robe from baby truth's unsheltered form, and round the desolated globe borne safely the bewildering charm. My tyrant slaves to a dungeon floor have bound the fearless innocent, and streams of fertilising gore flow from her bosom's hideous rent, which this unfailing dagger gave. I dread that blood. No more. This day is ours, though her eternal ray must shine upon our grave. Yet no, proud vice, had I not given to thee the robe I stole from heaven, thy shape of ugliness and fear had never gained admission here. Vice. And know that had I disdained to toil, but sate in my loathsome cave the while, and near to these hateful sons of heaven, gold, monarchy, and murder given, hadst thou with all thine art essayed one of thy games, then to have played with all thine overweening boast, falsehood, I tell thee thou hadst lost. Yet wherefore this dispute? We tend fraternal to one common end, in this cold grave beneath my feet, with our hopes, our fears, and our labours meet. Falsehood. I brought my daughter religion on earth. She smothered reason's babes in their birth. 
but dreaded their mother's eyes severe, so the crocodile slunk off slyly in fear, and loosed her bloodhounds from the den. They started from dreams of slaughtered men, and by the light of her poison eye did her work o'er the wide earth frightfully. The dreadful stench of her torches' flare, fed with human fat, polluted the air, the curses, the shrieks, the ceaseless cries of the many mingling miseries. As on she trod, ascended high, and trumpeted my victory. Brother, tell what thou hast done. Vice. I have extinguished the noonday sun in the carnage smoke of battles won. Famine, murder, hell, and power were glutted in that glorious hour, which searches fate had stamped for me with the seal of her security. For the bloated wretch on yonder throne commanded the bloody fray to rise. Like me, he joyed at the stifled moan wrung from the nation's miseries, while the snakes, whose slime even him defiled, in ecstasies of malice smiled. They thought was theirs, but mine the deed. Theirs is the toil, but mine the mead. Ten thousand victims madly bleed. They dream that tyrants goad them there with poisonous war to taint the air. These tyrants on their beds of thorns swell with the thoughts of murderous fame and with their gains to lift my name. Restless they plan from night to morn. I, I do all. Without my aid, thy daughter, that relentless maid, could never o'er a deathbed urge the fury of a venomed scourge. Falsehood. Brother, well, the world is ours, and whether thou or I have won, the pestilence expectant lowers on all beneath yon blasted sun. Our joys, our toils, our honours meet in the milk-white and wormy winding-sheet. A short-lived hope, unceasing care, some heartless scrape of goodly prayer, a moody curse and a frenzied sleep, air gapes the grave's unclosing deep, a tyrant's dream, a coward's start, the ice that clings to a priestly heart, a judge's frown, a courtier's smile, make the great whole for which we toil, and brother, whether thou or I have done the work of misery, it little boots. Thy toil and pain without my aid were more than vain, and but for thee I ne'er had sate the guardian of heaven's palace gate. And that's all from uh, Queen Mab for this reading. The next episode, whether it's the next program or if it's a, a, a couple in the future, will be... Um, Canto 5 and the notes, and there are several quite long notes accompanying that, so it, it will just be the single canto. Um, that's all for now. See you later. Bye.